Due to the many properties of synapses, complex function of nervous system is possible. These properties of synapses include forward conduction, synaptic delay, convergence and divergence, summation which is a spatial summation and temporal summation, synaptic facilitation, synaptic occlusion, synaptic fatigue and synaptic plasticity. Let us discuss each of them one by one. So first one is forward conduction. The term forward conduction means that the impulse can only be transmitted from presynaptic neuron to postsynaptic neuron. So here is a schematic diagram showing a presynaptic neuron where this is the cell body, this is the exon and this is the neuron terminal which is making contact with the postsynaptic neuron. So the impulse can only be transmitted from neuron A to neuron B and not from B to A. And why is that? This is because the neuron A actually releases neurotransmitters from its nerve terminals which act on the receptors which are present on the dendrites or the cell body of the postsynaptic neuron. So it is because that the presynaptic neuron is releasing the neurotransmitters which act on the receptors present on the postsynaptic neuron such that the impulse can only be transmitted in one way forward conduction and not in the opposite direction. So that is the first property. Coming to the next property that is synaptic delay. Synaptic delay means that there is a delay of approximately 0.5 millisecond to 1 millisecond which takes place at the level of the synaptic transmission. See basically impulse conduction here is movement of the charges and that movement of the charges is very fast because it is an electrical phenomena. But when we talk about synaptic transmission here chemicals are involved and there is some time which is involved in the release of the chemicals, the diffusion of the chemicals in the synaptic cleft to its receptors, then binding of the neurotransmitters to their receptors. And finally, the time taken for the opening of the ion channel. So this all takes some time and that time is 0.5 milliseconds to 1 millisecond. So why is this property important? See, if there is a pathway which is having large number of neurons which are connected in series, okay, say suppose 5 neurons are connected in series. On the other hand, there is another pathway in which only three neurons are connected in series. So can you tell that which of them will have a faster conduction? Obviously, the chain of neurons with lesser number of synapses. So that is the importance that time taken for the conduction of the impulse along the full pathway. Now, why is this important? Why do we want to know the time taken for the conduction of the impulse throughout the track? Well, it decides our reaction time to the various environmental stimuli. Say, suppose you might have heard about the visual reaction time or the auditory reaction time. See, the auditory pathway is having lesser number of synapses in its pathway. On the other hand, the visual pathway is much more complex and the number of synapses are more. So that is the reason that visual reaction time is more than the auditory reaction time meaning the time for us to respond to a visual stimulus is more than the time for us to respond to an auditory stimulus so that is the importance of synaptic delay let's move on to the third property that is the convergence of the neurons now here is a simple diagram which is showing three presynaptic neurons which are converging on a single postsynaptic neuron and actually it's a very simplistic diagram actually on a single neuron there are approximately thousand synapses okay thousand synapses per neuron are present so so many neurons are impinging on a single neuron so this is known as convergence and this is very important because this enables our nervous system to basically collect information from various sources and then finally the response is made based on the integrated information. So depending on whether the stimuli is coming from these two or the stimuli is coming from all three, the response which occurs in the postsynaptic neuron will differ. 
so it is kind of functioning as an integrator of information and final response is occurring so here we are talking basically converges from different sources one example i will tell you like for the regulation of the blood pressure see for the regulation of the blood pressure you know that uh, baroreflex is there but you see the final integration also depends on the input of the proprioceptors not only the baroreceptors proprioceptors then also the chemoreceptors isn't it what is the status of the oxygen and uh, partial pressure of uh, carbon dioxide in our blood and final response for the change in bp occurs based on the convergence of all these inputs so that is one type of convergence that is convergence from multiple sources but there is another type of convergence as well so here this diagram is showing convergence from a single source you see what i have drawn here that this is a single neuron and the exon is dividing into lot of nerve terminals which are making contact with the single postsynaptic neuron so one single neuron is making lot of synapses at the level of the postsynaptic neuron now what is the importance of this see when an action potential arrives what happens there is release of the neurotransmitter and either there is generation of epsp or ipsp at the level of the postsynaptic neuron by the way i have made another detailed video on epsp and ipsp the concept of epsp and ipsp do have a look at that video as well so yes i was talking about that there will be generation of epsp and ipsp at the level of the postsynaptic neuron and generally the value of this epsp is not much it is like a 0.5 millivolt so with a single action potential only this much epsp or ipsp is generated so this amount of epsp is not sufficient to cause uh, the change in potential to reach to the threshold isn't it so say suppose rmp is minus 70 millivolt generally the threshold is plus 15 millivolt from the resting membrane potential okay so maybe the threshold is minus 55 millivolt so this much epsp is not sufficient to reach to the threshold and for the generation of action potential but you see when one neuron is making lot of connections with a single postsynaptic neuron now this neuron can make more change in epsp so four neuron terminals means that a single neuron will cause a change in potential by approximately 2 millivolt so you see the weightage of the effect of this presynaptic neuron on the postsynaptic neuron is more so let us come back to this example say suppose one neuron is having more number of synapses okay more number of synapses and say suppose these is inhibitory synapses these are inhibitory synapses so you see if this particular neuron is activated the effect will be much more than the other two neuron so that is how the weightage of the effect of one particular presynaptic neuron on the postsynaptic neuron depends on the number of synapses it is making on the postsynaptic neuron fine so that was about the convergence let's move on to the next property that is divergence so here again there is a schematic diagram of divergence now one common example of divergence is seen in descending pathway that is the pyramidal tracts pyramidal tracts and what is this divergence you see that first a single exon divides into two nerve terminals and makes contact with two neurons which further divide and make contact with two other neurons so this is what this is divergence of the information from a single neuron to many other neurons and as i told you that this is seen in pyramidal tract what is happening that actually the neurons of the motor cortex carry the plan okay plan of movement and what happens that if we stimulate a neuron of the motor cortex then we get the contraction of a group of muscles so suppose uh, these are alpha motor neurons of the spinal cord and they are supplying the muscle fibers so what we get that when we stimulate a single motor cortex neuron we get the contraction of a group of muscles so the plan of action is being executed so that is one kind of divergence another kind of divergence also occurs in which information goes to different paths for different actions for example 
our proprioceptors right our proprioceptors that is uh, information is going via a sensory neuron what happens that uh, from here in the spinal cord this neuron so this is in the ventral region this neuron gives off a branch and makes contact with another neuron that is the alpha motor neuron so this information is coming from muscle spindle okay so this is making contact with the alpha motor neuron and that is leading to stretch reflex but also this information goes to the cortex it also goes to the cortex isn't it also it goes to another region it goes to cerebellum also so information goes to various other regions and what is the role here it is important for maintaining the balance the position of the body so that is also happening that is also a kind of divergence so that was the next property moving on to summation and first one in that is a spatial summation so this diagram we have seen before what is it showing it is showing convergence right so many neurons are impinging on a single post synaptic neuron now suppose all these three neurons fire simultaneously say suppose these two are excitatory neurons so they are going to generate epsp say suppose they generate a epsp of 0.5 millivolt right on the other hand this is a inhibitory neuron inhibitory neuron and that also fires so it will generate a ipsp of minus 0.5 millivolt so summation is that the end result the end voltage change which happens on the post synaptic membrane is a result of the summation of these potential change so if we sum this up it will come to a epsp of 0.5 millivolt so this is known as a spatial summation so that's what i was talking about the integration of information in convergence again detail about spatial summation and temporal summation i have given in the video of epsp and ipsp very important video please do have a look on that also to understand the concept clearly coming to the temporal summation now you see in this diagram i have not shown the convergence here a single neuron is making contact with the single post synaptic neuron so while in spatial summation we were talking of the neurons in space which are separated in space in temporal summation we are talking about the action potential in single neuron okay and how these action potentials are occurring repeatedly in time so say suppose there is one action potential and after uh, say suppose uh, 0.5 milliseconds there is another action potential okay and then again an action potential so what is happening that these action potentials are repeatedly stimulating our post synaptic neuron so now say first action potential causes a epsp of 0.5 millivolt okay now next action potential comes it will again cause a epsp of 0.5 millivolt right then third action potential again it will lead to a, a epsp of 0.5 millivolt okay but remember that there is a little time gap there is a time gap of 0.5 milliseconds so by the time the next action potential comes this epsp there is little bit loss of the charges and it may become like 0.4 millivolt okay so next action potential it came it became 0.5 millivolt again a new epsp i mean so 0.5 millivolt by the time third epsp came there will be again some loss of the charges in this small time right so maybe this has become 0.3 millivolt right so already some potential is there and this has become 0.4 millivolt and the third one it is coming 0.5 millivolt now all these will be summed up right so how much it will be actual total epsp will be 0.9 millivolt so this is known as temporal summation where the summation is happening over a period of time due to repeated action potentials in a single neuron spatial summation where the summation is happening over the space of the postsynaptic neuron because of various presynaptic neurons making contact with the postsynaptic neuron fine now with this concept of convergence and summation let us move on to next important uh, property that is synaptic facilitation so this is just an extension of the property of convergence and summation 
So let us try to understand it with a simple diagram. Say suppose here there are two presynaptic neurons. Let us call this a presynaptic neuron 1 and this one as presynaptic neuron 2. And we have four different uh, postsynaptic neurons. Let us name them as A, B, C and D. Right. Now suppose this presynaptic neuron 1 makes lot of synapses with this first postsynaptic neuron that is a postsynaptic neuron and the number of synapses are so much that the EPSP actually leads to change in potential to the threshold directly. So from minus 70 millivolt it changes to minus 55 millivolt. Okay, so so much EPSP is generated on this presynaptic neuron. If that happens, what will be the end result? There will be generation of action potential. Understanding. So when first presynaptic neuron is stimulated, there is action potential in a postsynaptic neuron. However, this presynaptic neuron 1 doesn't make so many synapses with the postsynaptic neurons B and C the synapses number is quite less. So will action potential be generated in B and C? No, right? There will only be EPSP, EPSP in B and C. So we call it that B and C are in subliminal fringe, subliminal fringe of this presynaptic neuron 1. Okay, so they are in subliminal fringe while A, is excited it is activated and it is known as in liminal fringe liminal fringe okay these are certain terms you should know there are other names as well this liminal fringe also known as discharge zone okay because discharge when we say the word it means the generation of action potential so this is discharge zone or also known as excited zone excited zone fine on the other hand, there are other names for this also subliminal fringe where we can call it as facilitated zone, facilitated zone or sub-threshold zone because the EPSP is not reaching to the threshold, so sub-threshold zone. So you see the term facilitated zone and what is the property known as? It is known as synaptic facilitation. So these B and C neurons are being facilitated by the presynaptic neuron number one. Fine. Now let's go on to the second one. Here what we are seeing again you see the presynaptic neuron number two. Suppose it makes lot of synapses with this G neuron. So what will happen? Again this becomes in the discharge zone or liminal fringe zone of the presynaptic neuron two and there will be action potential in the D neuron. But again this B and C they will only generate EPSP. So we have to hide this first one. Only when I am talking about two, that means only the second neuron is stimulated. So there will be EPSP in B and C. Now let's consider the third scenario where both first and second are stimulated simultaneously. What is going to happen? When both are going to be stimulated simultaneously, there will be action potential in neuron A. Obviously, there will be action potential in neuron D as well. Right, But now because these B and C are stimulated together by these presynaptic neuron 1 and 2, there will be more EPSPs and maybe it reaches to the threshold also and there will be action potential in both B and C. So when we talk separately about these neurons 1 and 2, then this B and C are in subliminal fringe or the facilitated zone. But see, because of the property of convergence and because of the property of summation, what has happened that when both of these neurons are stimulated simultaneously, then the EPSP can reach to the threshold and lead to the generation of action potential. Fine. So that is the property of synaptic facilitation. Moving on to synaptic occlusion. Again, we are having the same diagram, but to understand synaptic occlusion, you see what is going on that maybe the stimulation of first neuron leads to action potential in all these three neurons. So what we are saying is that it is making lot of synapses with all these neurons, right? So everywhere the EPSP will reach to the threshold and lead to generation of action potential in A, B and C. 
on the other hand when we talk about the second only second we are stimulating then again if this neuron is making lot of synapses with all these neurons then stimulation of second neuron will again lead to action potential in b c and d right so if you see stimulation of first neuron leads to action potential in three neurons okay on the other hand stimulation of second neuron also leads to action potential in three neurons right but if we stimulate both of the neurons simultaneously then action potential occurs in how many neurons yes there are only four neurons right so there will be action potential in all of the neurons that is four neurons action potential so what we say that synaptic occlusion is that when one and two are stimulated simultaneously simultaneously then the effect is less than the stimulation of one and two separately and if we add them up you see what we are saying again you see that first neuron stimulation then action potential in three neurons second neuron stimulation again action potential in three neurons mathematically if we add them up it should come to six neurons but that is not happening so when we stimulate them simultaneously the effect is less than the sum of the effect of one and two neurons stimulated separately and why is that what is the reason simple because there are supplying two common neurons so that is just by the virtue of supplying two common neurons that we are getting the effect which is lesser than the sum so that is known as synaptic occlusion moving on to the property of synaptic fatigue what synaptic fatigue says that if there is a repeated stimuli in a single presynaptic neuron then due to repeated stimulation there will be exhaustion of the neurotransmitters which are stored here right every nerve terminal has a store of neurotransmitters and if repeated stimuli are coming lot of these neurotransmitters will be released and finally there will be exhaustion of these neurotransmitters so we call it that synaptic fatigue has occurred that now even though action potential is coming the impulse will not be transmitted to the post synaptic neurons because hardly any neurotransmitters are there and this phenomena we might have all experienced where we see a fatigue after a heightened state of mental activity right suppose you are doing heavy work and after heavy cognitive activity i mean you will feel extremely tired so that is synaptic fatigue that for some time you will not be able to do the similar kind of heavy cognitive work another example is that uh, in seizures in epileptic attacks what happens that uh, due to extreme activity in the nervous system right extreme uh, continued state of stimulation of the neurons after some time there is exhaustion of the neurotransmitters and there is a spontaneous stoppage of this epileptic attacks fine now let us move on to the final synaptic property that is synaptic plasticity so synaptic plasticity means ability of the synapse to change over time on the basis of past experience what does this mean this means that suppose this is the connection of the neuron this is presynaptic neuron and postsynaptic neuron and this presynaptic neuron generates a epsp say suppose of 0.5 millivolt now what synaptic plasticity says that with experience due to past experience or when we talk about synapse let's not the use the term experience let us say that the past activity in the presynaptic neuron this epsp may either increase it may become 1 millivolt right so that is known as strengthening of the response or it may become 0.2 millivolt so there is weakening of the response right so the transmission what is occurring that has changed so this property is known as synaptic plasticity and there are various ways of synaptic plasticity there is long term potentiation long term depression habituation sensitization 
and all of these i have dealt in other videos long term potentiation i have a separate video please do have a look on that habituation and sensitization again i have a separate video and long term depression is nothing but little bit opposite of long term potentiation potentiation means increase in the strength of the synapse that means epsp from 0.5 millivolt it will become 1 millivolt long term depression means decrease in the strength of the synapse so, so from 0.5 millivolt it may become 0.2 millivolt fine only one synaptic plasticity mechanism i will discuss here that is post tetanic potentiation and what is it post tetanic potentiation says that if there are multiple stimuli repeated train of action potentials in presynaptic neuron then there will be lot of calcium influx in the presynaptic neuron that happens in any synaptic transmission because of action potential there is opening of voltage gated calcium channels and then calcium enters into the presynaptic terminal and it is this calcium which causes a release of the neurotransmitters now if this repeated train of action potentials is coming what will happen that more and more calcium is going to enter into the presynaptic terminal and because of this increased calcium influx there will be increased release of the neurotransmitters and that is going to increase the amount of the epsp change which is happening on the postsynaptic neuron and mostly i am talking about epsp here but remember it depends on what type of synapse it is so anyways increase neurotransmitter release so that means more neurotransmitters will act on their receptors and hence the potential change will be more so that was about synaptic plasticity for other mechanisms please watch my other videos so these were all the properties of the synapse thanks for watching the video if you liked it do press the like button share the video with others and don't forget to subscribe to the channel physiology open thank you